사업의 전 파리 교육감님께서 프랑스 관점에서 교육 불평등에 대한 도전이라는 주제로 강연을 해주실 텐데 먼저 잠시 제가 이분에 대한 설명을 드리겠습니다. 예, 프랑스 사회학자이면서 2016년 10월 초까지 프랑스 파리 교육감직을 역임한 프랑스와 베이 전 파리 교육감님은 이 포럼을 준비하는 동안 2016년 10월 3일부로 국가정책법률심의 및 자문기관 위원으로 임명되셨습니다. 이 기관으로 말할 것 같으면 정부와 국회가 고시, 법률 등 국가 행정 절차 등을 수립하고 시행하는 그 전반을 심의하고 판단하는 곳으로 프랑스 최고 지성인들만 임명되는 최고의 명예직입니다. 분쟁, 내모, 재무, 행정, 정책 보고서 등의 영역에서 연 천여 건을 심의하고 있습니다. 주요 저서로는 미국 개보학의 역사, 뉴욕의 역사 등이 있습니다. 아, 그럼 프랑스와 베이 전 파리 교육감님을 모시고 기조 강연을 듣겠습니다. Education reform works a little like me. Slowly, sometimes clumsily, but in order to achieve it, you need willpower. I want to uh, talk today about educational inequality in, in France and what has been uh, done to fight it over the last few years. But first, let, let me tell uh, Superintendent Cho the pleasure and the honor to uh, have been invited to Seoul today to deliver one of the keynote lectures in this um, Seoul International Forum. It's a great, great pleasure for me to share some thoughts on education in, in, in France. And I want to do that from a political point of view, uh, from a general political point of view, from someone who for four and a half years was responsible for education in Paris, responsible for education from K2 to universities, since I was both the rector of the academy and the chancellor of the universities um, of Paris. Um, in the French system, uh, France is divided in 30 academies, each of them being uh, headed by a rector, who is also chancellor of the university, a superintendent, if you want, who is in charge of education in his or her academy. It's a centralized system, which goes back to the early 19th century, which goes back to, to Napoleon, in fact. Um, and um, this means that the rectors are uh, responsible for education at the, at the territorial level under the authority of the Minister of Education. And like superintendents in Korea, rectors in France are not elected officials. They are appointed by the President, by the President of the Republic, and they serve at the pleasure of the President. But they are academics. And since they are academics, they have a freedom of thought and a freedom of speech, which they um, usually use. And although I'm not a rector anymore, I'll try to use that freedom of speech and that freedom of thought in the next, um, in the next few minutes. The first point I want to make today is what I call the challenge of French education. Uh, and the challenges ahead of us in, in France. There are a few things you need to know about education in France. The first one is that education is a public service and uh, has been a public service since the 19th century. Um, educational issues are in, intimately um, connected to the history of the Republic and to the history of republicanism in France. Um, and when the Republic was created in France in the 1870s, educators, but also political leaders, defined education 
as free, secular, and compulsory for everyone. And that was primary education. And throughout the 20th century, this vision of what we call a Republican education, what people at the time called a, a teaching republic, this vision not only survived, but grew to include not only primary education like in the 19th century, but secondary education as of the 1950s and 1960s. In other words, there was a democratization of secondary education, which in the early 20th century was a bourgeois preserve, but by the late 20th century had become really democratic, really accessible to a much, much larger proportion of young French women and men than ever before. So that's the first thing, public. Second, education is centralized. And behind centralization lay both a very deep French tradition that um, France should be centralized and centralization, the core of centralization is Paris. Um, this is something that was dismantled during the revolution but immediately recreated by Napoleon in the early 19th century. And that's when the system of academy uh, directed by rectors was put in place and since the early 19th century it has of course changed slightly but the notion that there is a minister of education that there and that there are territorial rectors has remained very strong so education is public education is democratic education is centralized and as a consequence the state plays a major role in education in France. 85% of all children attend public schools. And most of the others who attend private schools attend private schools which receive, which have signed a contract with the state and receive uh, funding, for instance, for paying teachers. And therefore, the budget of French education is by far the, best, the, the biggest one in the French, um, in the French state. Well, today, this system faces a series of major challenges. And um, that's why since 2012, since um, the socialist president, François Hollande, was elected, um, he has been trying to redefine the system, re what we call refounding French education. Um, why? Because we face Something you know in Korea too, we discussed that with Superintendent Cho and we heard what Superintendent Cho said yesterday. An increased uh, inequality among French schools and an increased disparity in social performance by French children. A disparity which is in part the result of deep social economic and cultural inequality in France um, and which has to be addressed. We also need to, to address the, we also need to address um, changing the way we teach, changing the pedagogy to the new needs of the 21st century. And thirdly, we have also to transform and this is really the place to say that, I'm very impressed by this, um, this place, transforming the training of our future teachers for helping them operate um, happily, happily and efficiently in the classroom of the 21st century. And clearly these three issues um, transforming the training of our teachers, adapting the pedagogy, fighting inequality are connected. Um, one cannot be addressed without the two others. And remember that in the French case, any reform has to be done in the context of a public, democratic and centralized system. Well, that's why in 2012, 
when, when President Hollande was elected, the, the need for a major uh, um, policy initiative became acute because over the previous 10 years, I will make uh, politics for a few seconds, over the previous 10 years, 2002-2012, the, 2000, the uh, conservative uh, neoliberal governments uh, who, were in, who were in place had really neglected education. Major cuts had impacted uh, the education budget. Uh, thousands and thousands of positions had been suppressed. Training programs for a future teacher had been cut. Um, and even the length of the school week for children had been reduced from four, four and a half days to four days a week, which made France the only country of uh, OECD um, uh, to have the lowest number of school days in France by uh, 2012. And at the time, the government argue, argued that reducing the number of teachers would make it possible for them to pay them better. Well, in fact, what they did was reduce the number of teachers, but they forgot to pay them better. Um, and clearly, this type of context prevented any pedagogical transformation. While children's school performance, as measured by PISA tests, for instance, continued to diminish in, on average. So basically, the situation in 2012 was bad, and this was what I call the challenge of French education. So, what did we do over the last four years? Well, the um, governments, the socialist government that succeeded since 2012 have um, um, launched a major educational initiative to break up with the choices which had been made before 2012. Um, there were several laws which were passed. Uh, there was an impressive budgetary effort which was made by the government, and it was all the more impressive in the difficult economic situation of um, France. And clearly, for um, the president and for the ministers in charge behind um, this effort, which was not an easy one, um, lay the belief that an investment in education is the best possible investment for the future for a country. Education being, uh, as you know, as we all know here, far less costly uh, politically, economically, and culturally than ignorance. Um, so what did we do? First, we tried to reduce educational inequality. This is the topic of this conference. Um, and it is a major issue because in France we had a growing gap between those children who succeed and those who fail. Um, in fact, failure, school, failure in school generally amounted to exclusion from most opportunities available in the knowledge society we know um, today. And therefore, the, redu the reduction of inequality, the reinvention of French education, as we called it, was um, an attempt to reinvent what I call the, the promise of, of, of French, of Republican education. We decided to focus on kindergarten and the elementary education first, something that had not been done since the 19th century. Uh, since the 19th century, we had invested lots of money in our high schools, but very little in elementary schools. So we went back to the basics. We created several thousand uh, teaching positions, and the rectors, like myself, were told, were urged to allocate these resources to fight educational inequality. And in particular, we started four programs. First, we re-established a, um, a school day, a longer school day, with a, another half day of school, actually, 
uh, to go back to the means uh, OECD uh, duration of schooling. Um, second, we remapped what we call priority education. Well, priority education is actually um, low income, a school with low income families. And we had a map of this priority education, which went back to the mid 1990s. Uh, in places like Paris, there has been a lot of change, social change, since the mid 1990s. Gentrification, for instance, and um, there was a gap between the social reality and the allocation of means. So in Paris, for instance, I dramatically reduced the number of uh, areas which we call priority education. And in these areas, we allocated all the means that we had for, um, for, this, um, uh, transform for, for this program. In other words, we took into account the gentrification of parts of, um, of, parts of Paris. Second, uh, third actually, we open a program for two, year, uh, for two years old. We open kindergarten to two years old, especially in areas of low income families. Families which, as we say, are um, far away from the culture of the school, far away from the culture of education, mostly immigrant families and whose or families who would not pressure their kids into learning. So we try to get those kids earlier in school. It's been very complicated uh, to do that because we had to convince these families one by one that going to school at two years old was good for their children. Um, and we have had um, some success, but uh, not full success for, for for that. Um, the fourth program we initiated was called More Teachers and Classrooms. And that meant that in uh, these schools of priority education, we put two teachers in the same, in one classroom. And uh, one of the teacher was teaching, and the other one was also teaching, but was taking care of a small group of children or uh, children with special needs. Um, and um, to some of you, or maybe to many of you, it may not seem revolutionary. For France, this program was absolutely revolutionary because of the intense, affective, often intimate relationship which exists um, between kindergarten, elementary school teachers and their classrooms. Classrooms as space. You know, it's my classroom. So to share my classroom with another teacher was something which meant a lot of discussion with the unions for the rector. Um, and of course, we selected the schools which received children from families which concentrated a disproportionate share of uh, economic distress. Um, and this made it possible to provide better attention to children who needed it most. What I did in Paris was done in other academies, but each rector could adapt the general um, rules to the specific situation. Paris was different from Bordeaux or Marseille or in other parts of the country. And we had, of course, a margin of appreciation um, to um, uh, to adapt uh, an urban academy and a rural academy are, of course, uh, very, um, very different. In Paris, and Paris being Paris, the capital of uh, France, um, I tried to use two other resources. One was culture. But Paris is, of course, you know, the center of French culture. We have dozens of museums of uh, cultural places and we were underusing them. Uh, what we did was sign um, agreements between the academy, between the rectorate of Paris, and these cultural institutions, 
and um, we uh, asked these cultural institutions to develop uh, exchanges and programs of cooperation, particularly with the schools which um, hosted the most, the children with most, uh, with strongest economic needs, the, the, the children which were in most trouble. Um, one example, we just heard this wonderful uh, Seoul uh, Orchestra. Um, we created a program with the Paris Opera for little violinists chosen from um, um, low-income uh, elementary schools. And the opera provided two violins, two violins per, children, per child, one for the house, one for the school. So to avoid that, you know, they would lose the violin between the house and the school. And this kid learned violin for three or four years. They were not musicians. They were not selected. I insist on that. They were not selected on a musical talent. Uh, but they learned music somewhere better than others. Um, what was magic in this program was, well, first that in the end they could play music. Um, and second, that the whole school, the whole school, um, pride, prided itself from this program. So it went far beyond the 30 or 40 kids who learned the violin. It had an impact on the general, um, on the general school. Um, and of course, the kids who learned the violin had much better results than children from similar background which did, were not, uh, who did not enter these types of program. Another way to open our schools has been um, international relations. Um, an agreement with the rectorate of Seoul, for instance, and with other uh, major cities in the world has been extremely important. Why? Because in these low-income families, in these priority education schools, um, these children usually suffer from a very narrow worldview. Um, I remember an elementary school where the kids had a vision of the world which was limited to three streets around the school. They had never seen the Louvre Museum. They had never crossed the Seine River. They had never seen the Eiffel Tower, just, you know, the top of the Eiffel Tower from far away. Of course, Europe, Europe didn't mean anything to them. And the world didn't mean anything to them. So what we did was allocate, when we created exchange programs, we allocated more means for these schools from uh, low-income low children. Um, and we took that money away from schools which have had more um, uh, kids for more privileged, um, more privileged background, and this way we try to broaden the horizon of these kids, because we think that broadening the horizon is a way to stimulate the ambition, is a way to make it possible for children to succeed academically. Then. So we, we had these programs. Then we also tried to transform French schools pedagogically. And um, believe me, that's not easy. Uh, but we have tried to really change the traditional way of teaching, which was a sort of vertical communication of knowledge from a knowing teacher to a learning a child. Um, and this is a system which worked well in the past in a far less democratic school than the one we know uh, today. Um, because when the kids could not learn or did not learn, the traditional answer was discipline, the stern display of authority. Um, and of course, the result depended on whether the kids accepted or not. Uh, authority. Um, we have been trying to change this over the last uh, 
over the last few years and um, learn from methods implemented in other European countries such as Finland but also in the United States for instance um, and transform um, this based on experimental schools where we test these new methods and then we try to convince teachers to adapt their to their um, new schools. In other words, we wanted and we want our schools to be more benevolent than they were and that they are. And this is um, this is uh, this been really part of this transformation, uh, this encounter with other pedagogical uh, traditions. Um, and this has been done both in the elementary schools and in the junior high schools. We started with junior high school last September. We'll do it uh, for high schools uh, as of uh, next year or the year after that. And of course, a connected transformation was the digital ambition for, for our schools. I will not um, uh, uh, speak too much about that. But we had no coordinated program for a digital school we developed a coordinated um, uh, program of digital resources, uh, a major initiative at the national level. The last goal was to train teachers adequately. It was not difficult to do better than our predecessors since, since they had suppressed teacher training. So we started from scratch. We re-established training schools, what we called superior schools of, for teaching and education, there is one per academy. They connect universities and schools and rectorates. And um, we have changed the way uh, it used to be done in the past. You first went to the university, you succeeded in the competition to become a teacher, and then you started uh, teaching, and at the same time, you started to learn what teaching meant. Uh, which meant that you had a first a theoretical training and then you had a practical training. Well, we decided to change that and then make a mixed uh, theoretical and practical uh, training from, from, from the beginning for our teachers and for the last three years it's worked um, pretty well. Where are we after four years of uh, trying to recreate uh, an ambition for a Republican school? Um, well, truth commands to acknowledge that our results are mixed in terms of reducing educational inequality, despite the efforts and despite the financial means. I'm not claiming that um, this is a great success, and France remains one of the most unequal educational countries in Europe and in the world. We are still best at making our best students succeed, and we are far less convincing to help our not so good students at, being, at, bring out, at bringing out the best they have in them. Why? Why so? Uh, in part because this is a major revolution for us. It's a major cultural change. And um, cultural change of this magnitude takes time, unless we are in a revolutionary period. And we are not in a revolutionary period, so this means that it works when we convince people of the interest of tra on transforming the way they teach. The key people are the teachers and the school principals. So we have to convince them one by one, so to speak, of the interest of transforming the way they teach or the way they uh, direct um, their, their, their schools. Our system has been invented for a far less democratic period than the one we know today, and the adaptation to a more democratic era is, is, um, is difficult. When we have discussion with politicians about that in France, there is always a consensus that we could do better, but once we start saying, okay, this consensus means that we will have to do this and that, then the consensus breaks, and, um, and it becomes very hard to implement new, um, new measures. Um, and this is not a right and left issue in France. It's not, we, it's actually, we have conservatives 
and we have progressives on both sides of the political spectrum, which makes it uh, not easy for educators. But at the same time, as we know where the answers lay, public financial efforts, without money, nothing is possible. Pedagogical transformation without sacrificing content. So there is a fine line there between content and how to pass it on to students. Providing students from low income families with resources, cultural resources. You talked about Habitus yesterday, quoting Pierre Bourdieu. Um, well, Bourdieu was a colleague of mine at the School for Advanced Studies in Social Sciences. I agree with you. Um, we have to provide the students with the cultural resources they don't have um, in their family, and in, they don't have uh, naturally. Uh, with a global vision they cannot find at home, we must mix students from various backgrounds. So, um, now I've left my, my position in education, I've moved to a um, um, different type of uh, life in the highest uh, uh, in France's highest administrative court, um, but I can only, I, I, I know at this moment that France, like Korea, and like many other countries, faces major choices for the future and I really hope that we all will um, choose to continue to invest in, in the future and for the future. Thank you.